<clears throat> Welcome to the Undeserved Flavor, where we taste and we see that the Lord is good. How's that for an intro? <clears throat> what's, up, what's up, happy people? Um, so, uh, I have made mention that I wanted to get into this book, Miracle Workers, Reformers, and the New Mystics. Um, so largely the point of this channel is ultimately to kind of make an argument for Christian universalism, pose an argument, pose a case, present a case for Christian universalism. <clears throat> so this is going to be a little bit of an extracurricular activity on the channel. Um, I think it's absolutely equally as important um, because uh, the re one of the reasons why I feel like <clears throat> I should get into this and throw in a little kind of bonus material alongside of the constant case for universalism material is, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think largely the, the people that are coming to this channel, um, are f coming across it be because, you know, YouTube understands your search and keywords such as Christian universalism and the like, or deconstruction or grace or I don't know. But, um, what I've noticed a lot over the years in this journey to into uh, Christian universalism is a lot of Christians are literally they'll, they'll get the revelation and then the church completely lets them down. Let, let, like for example, um, you know someone discovers universalism in the Bible. You know, they discover all the all passages and then they do a little digging and they find out Jesus never actually preached on a underworld called hell or an eternal conscious torment. Um, you do some digging and you find out what he actually preached on wasn't eternal conscious torment or annihilation or hell, uh, a Greek pagan word that was added hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus walked to the scriptures. Anyway, <clears throat> so let's say a common Christian kind of starts coming in this direction, exploring the possibility of God being better than we've been taught, and then they take it to their pastor, and their pastor just literally flushes them down the toilet and now they're hurt they're jaded they've been ostracized for simply asking questions um <clears throat> i know this happens because i've experienced it firsthand um we moved across the country as a family we didn't know anybody and we were church hopping you know just to kind of get a feel for a good community get our get plugged in here and um, I would make it a point to, um, you know, after being at a church for at least a few weeks, if not a few months, um, have a sit down with the pastor. No matter how big the church was, you know, you can arrange a meeting with the pastor. Granted, I haven't done it with the church that we're going to now. <clears throat> That's a story for another day. Um, I just don't feel it's as important in this case with the church we're at right now, but I did want to talk to the pastors of the churches that we were going to, and I sat down with a pastor of a church that uh, was a pretty good-sized church, and um, I did not allude to my standing on Christian universalism. We were sitting down at a Panera Bread, and I, you know, top, typical small talk, and <laughs> I started asking questions. I'm like, so I'm kind of into the early church fathers. 
Um, it's pretty cool, you know, seeing what the disciples of the disciples and their disciples had to say about the gospel, the message, the way, and see how they did church back then and what their thoughts were. Um, what do you think about uh, this guy or that guy or when he said this or when he said that? And um, I was, they weren't even leading questions, but they were <clears throat> um, questions. I, I mean, the statements from these early church fathers, I wish I remembered what I actually said to them, were, were basically, you know, presenting a really good God and a really good gospel. <clears throat> Nothing super controversial, um, but it was like he was staring at me like a deer in headlights. And it was almost like he immediately um, assumed that I was coming at him with a new idea. Because he literally said, to be completely honest with you, I don't have time for this. I have people coming to me and emailing me, calling me on a daily basis with all kinds of, you know, the latest and greatest new fun idea. I'm like, wait a minute, hold up. Since when is the ancient uh, patristic works, since, since when is that new? Like, that's not, that's like the oldest thing that we have as a church. I mean, like, th this isn't new. Is it, it may be new to you, which is kind of weird. Not a good thing. Like, you should be talking to, about church history, at least sometimes, you know, you are a Christian, right? You should know where you came from. Um, anyway, so he basically straight up said, why are you here? You're not going to mesh with our community. You're not going to get along with anybody. What are you doing? I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't say I was going to argue with anybody. I'm not trying to rock the apple cart or be a pest or anything like that. I'm literally just had my family coming to church. We haven't been talking to anybody about any of this stuff. You know, we've made a few friends. We've gone to some small groups, you know, not once did I bring up any of this stuff until I sat down with you here, Mr. Pastor at Panera. And I've just had a few questions for you. You know, you're the pastor of the church. Aren't you the guy should be bringing questions like this too? Old buddy, old pal, pastor of the church. <clears throat> and uh, that conversation went cold real fast. And I don't think we went to another service at that church. I did end up meeting with an associate pastor at that church a couple times at a coffee shop afterwards. And it's, it's funny how, like, pastors, you know, church leadership, they've absolutely, I mean, they've gone through seminary and you know, got all the Christian education under the sun. And you, you start talking about early church fathers and they're deer in headlights. I mean, like, obviously they don't remember any of it. And it's of no interest to them. So anyway, um, rant over. But that is applicable to, you know, why I wanted to get into this as a little bit of an extracurricular activity here on the channel. Um, I don't think it's a good thing for Christians who are exploring the universalist um, Christian way, which was the original gospel. Um, I don't think it's a good thing for them to, when they get burned by the church, hop on YouTube or Google or whatever and not be able to find any content whatsoever to help them navigate the waters. Um, and so they end up tossing baby Jesus out with the bath water. Now I'm a Buddhist. Now I believe in the universe. God is all of us and we are God. Completely depersonifying God as Father. And like I said, tossing baby Jesus out with the bath water. Now, is it completely a bad thing that they do that mm, that could be debated because you know did they really have a true relationship 
with Jesus and God to begin with? Or were they just going through the motions? Or maybe where they were just born into Christianity and, you know, fed the lines and following the cult? You know, who knows? But, uh, like, God is Father. It's legit. He's personified in Jesus Christ. And you can still have a relationship with him. It's just not as defined by modern day Christianese, where you have to say a prayer, aka hocus pocus magic trick, and now you're saved. Holy Ghost shacks up in you, whereas before he didn't live in you. <clears throat> okay, I'm rambling. Um, what I want to get into some of these. Um, stories for is like God shows up in every flavor of Christianity and God shows up in every flavor of humanity outside of Christianity. So if you didn't think God could show up in another religious organization, you're going to have to burn that sacred cow. Barbecue that bad boy up. Throw the barbecue sauce on it. And, well, burn it. Just burn it. Don't waste the barbecue sauce. Just toss it. Okay? Um, <laughs> this book focuses on Christian miracle workers, reformers, new mystics, whatever they call it, the new mystics, because it's a cool name. But, like, let's get into it. Um, so, yeah, I know this video... It's me rambling as usual, um, and the vast majority of, if there were any new viewers here, probably tuned off. But if you skipped forward, and I'll put in the comments, <clears throat> skip to whatever this minute is. I don't know what we're at. Ten minutes. I don't know. Um, to get right into the nuts and bolts. So anyway, this. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think I can come to it. A point. Why? What, what's my point? My point is, you don't have to toss baby Jesus out with the bathwater, and God shows up no matter where you are, who you are, or what you are. And we do live in a supernatural reality. We are supernatural beings. We are spiritual beings. G like, the will of God is heaven on earth. The will of God is the manifest presence of God and His power and kindness and love and nature through us on earth as the body of Christ, right? Okay, well, what does that look like? Does it look like going to your common modern-day Lutheran church every Sunday that uh, believe that the miracles in power died with the apostles? And that was just a good for jumpstart in the religion? No, not even in the slightest. Like, that's dead over there. Dead, dead, dead. It's not Christianity. You know? At all, not even a little bit. Um, it's it's those who go inward and seek God within, and <laughs> non dogmatically or superstitiously cultivate a life and lifestyle of seeking the truth, seeking their spiritual oneness and reality with God, their Father, who is personified. He's a person. Anyway, why don't I read one of these off and give you a little bit of taste because I plan on doing a few of these more in the future without this insane long rant to begin with, an explanation as to why I'm doing this. So let's just go through here. Um, name off a few of these. You may have heard of them. Enoch. Sadhu Sundar Singh. Saint Anselm of Canterbury. Saint Maurice and the Theban Legion. Theban Legion. I don't know how you say that. Saint Dennis. Saint Falcian. And Saint Victories. Saint Necton. I can't pronounce these guys, so laugh all you want. <clears throat> Saint... Nicasius, St. Anthony the Abbot, St. Augustine of Hippo, 
Mahesh Shavda, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Herman of Alaska, Lonnie Frisbee, St. Patrick, Seraphim of Serov, John Alexander Dowie, St. Francis Xavier, David Hogan, Heidi Baker, St. Bernard, St. Luke the Younger, St. Joseph Capertino, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Christina the Astonishing, Mel Tara, Emperor Constantine, George Fox. <clears throat> so, just to pause here for a second. Just because they're in this book, the new mystics, miracle workers, reformers, whatever, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to, they're going to be presented in a really positive light. But we'll have to see. What does this book say about these guys? Brother Lawrence. Love that one. Todd Bentley. That's an interesting one, if you know the story. Madam Jan Guyon. That's a good one. Jan von Ray Ruysbroek. St. John of the Cross. Charles Finney. The, Mora the Moravians, the Methodists, Hugh Bourne, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Maria Woodworth Etter, John G. Lake, Evan Roberts, Stephen Jeffries, Charles Fox Parham, Edward Irving, William Seymour, Smith Wigglesworth, James Salter, Amy Simple McPherson, Dr. Charles Price. William Branham, Gordon Lindsay, Oral Roberts, Jack Coe, T.L. Osborne, F.F. Bosworth, Raymond <laughs> T. Rickey, William Freeman, Tommy Hicks, David Nunn, A.A. A. Allen, O.L. Jaggers, Marjo Gortner, Roland Buck, Finnis Dake. <clears throat> um... Did I not see Benny Hinn in here? Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. You missed one. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a it's an anomaly to me. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more too, but I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're if you're naming off modern day mystics like David Hogan, Heidi Baker, and not putting Benny Hinn among the mix, like in a chapter called Power Missions, come on, man! And you got Todd Bentley in here. Seriously, I'm just giving you a hard time. This book is uh, one of your first back when you were a young buck. But uh, it's a good book nonetheless. <clears throat> let's jump into, let's say, a random page. Let's go to, let's find the beginning of a guy's story, guy or gal. Let's find one that we may have heard of. St. Teresa of Avila, 1515 to 1582, was another widely known saint with a history of levitation. Eyewitnesses said she would hover about a foot and a half off the ground during states of spiritual rapture for periods of up to a half an hour. She is reported to have said it was much more violent than other spiritual visitations, and I was therefore as one ground to pieces. During her life, Teresa founded the Order of Dis Discalced, Barefoot, Carmelite Nuns. She was frequently met with visions and prophetic encounters, now recognized as a prominent mystic of her day. 
Her contemporaries were quick to condemn her experiences back then. After seeking guidance from a number of clergy who frowned upon such activity, Teresa was one day taken into an encounter where she heard the words, I will not have you hold conversation with men, but with angels. Her revelatory happenings were extremely intense, including a number of clear open visions and audible conversations. She also received the transfer transverberatio, or supernatural piercing of the heart. Teresa is well regarded for a number of deep mystical writings, not in the least of which is Interior Castle. In it, she describes various rooms of the soul and the soul's purification or sanctification process. Her writings parallel the famed Christian mystic St. John of the Cross, who was also her contemporary and eventually cared for a number of spiritual foundations which Teresa established for men. Teresa was probably quite reserved, and she preferred not to mention these levitations. She said that the experiences frightened her at times. Whenever, we were whenever there were angelic encounters and other powerful miracles or visitations in Scripture, people were often afraid. I believe one of the things that prevents us from moving into more bizarre miracles and heavenly experiences is our fear of the unknown. We must trust the Spirit of God to lead us. We need to be prepared to press into the strange and unusual. Don't you think the flaming tongues of fire were a bit unusual and unorthodox on Pentecost? Where was the spiritual precedent when that happened? We're often too afraid of dynamic influence of demonic influence to try new things with God. <clears throat> Those who move in supernatural power are always accused of being demoniacs. Jesus himself was accused of using demonic power, and he was our prototype. If they said this about him, they'll say it about us. We must have discernment, but discernment is not just a cowardly free feeling of warning and self-protection. It is also discerning the voice of Jesus when he is calling you to step out of the boat and walk on the water. Jesus is nudging us out of the boat. He is asking us, are you blind? Are you so blind that you do not recognize the spirit in which I speak? Just a quick glance at the ecstatic biblical prophets should tell us not to judge a book by its cover. Pretty cool. So, yeah, I'm going to be reading some more stories like that. They're short. You know, there's a bunch of different people to cover. Um, I mean, like, there's a guy. <laughs> um, I don't remember the guy's name, but there's a guy that uh, he was martyred while he was praying. They chopped his head off, and he stooped down, picked up his head, carried it like this, continued praying, walked a distance, finished his prayer, fell down, and died. I mean, not clinically possible, right? Anyway, so, yeah, that's kind of my plan. Um, extracurricular plan, aside from my normal scheduled programming of making a case for Christian universalism. So if you'd like to see more of those, um, drop a comment, drop a comment saying yes please thanks for watching it is actually kind of late tonight so that's kind of why I'm rambling more than usual into nowhere anyway thanks for watching taste and see the Lord is good